All right, welcome to the ECG Stampede Unit 1. This is really exciting, John. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. You ready to get going? Yeah, let's jump in. Let's do it. Case 1. All right, so this is a 39-year-old female that presented with chest pain. John, you take this away, man. Yeah, so this case is intended to teach the basics of ECG interpretation. We don't need basics. Let's just run. We don't need to crawl. Let's just run. We're going to crawl first. We're going to use this uh, ECG as the foundation of, you know, and some building blocks for where we're going over the next 10 units. There are a lot of different ways that one can approach ECGs, and none of them are really wrong. <sighs> but I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that our way is right. Always righter. It's more right. It's the rightest. The most rightest? The, the, okay, you win. <laughs> yes, finally got one. So anyways, I think that this is probably the simplest and most ubiquitous approach to ECG interpretation. We're going to look at rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, and signs of ischemia. Can mm, you mm -hmm. say that, Ben? I can, I can. Rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, signs of ischemia. Oh, that was like nice and melodic. Yeah. There's a little song there. Very I almost nice. feel like we could be, uh, you know, marching through the streets of New York in leather jackets, kind of crouched over and West snapping. West Side Story. Great. Rhythm. rhythm axis, axis. Intervals. Signs, signs of ischemia. ischemia. I think we yeah. got really fast there. Yeah. I, I, that felt good. I, no, I felt, I, my heart was like pounding. Yeah. No, I'm excited. We're, we're about to attack. All right. So why don't we jump in and start talking about rate We're going to attack rate. Here we go. On a standard ECG, there are small boxes and there are large boxes. The small boxes represent 40 milliseconds or 0.04 seconds, as you can see here. And the large boxes, which are comprised of five small boxes, therefore represent 200 milliseconds. So we're going to do a little math exercise here, John. I don't know if you're ready for it. Ooh, I wasn't told there'd be math on this test. There's going to be math on this test. So pretend that there is a QRS complex on this first large box and then also another one on the second large box. And let's see what the rate would be if we had a beat every 200 milliseconds. So one beat every 200 milliseconds. How many milliseconds are in a second? Oh, boy. There are 1,000 milliseconds. Good. Very good. You're passing second. so far. Oof, I, I was anxious when you how, asked me that question. How many seconds in a minute? There are 60 seconds in one minute. You're passing again so far. Oh, we're going to do some ipso facto crossing out some I, units I and stuff. I'm pretty sure that was pig Latin. That's not real what you just said. <laughs> Let's cross out some units here. Seconds cross out, milliseconds cross out, and we're left with beats per minute. So I need you to do that math for me, John. I'm going to go with 300. 300. Well done. I didn't think you had it in you, but I honestly don't think you did the math. I think you just knew the answer. I have been shown the slides before. <laughs> You had the answers beforehand, cheater. Like your Astros. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> had to get that Snuck in. Snuck that one in there. Had to get that in. <laughs> Ouch. Gosh, that smarts. Okay, so if you had a QRS complex, every large box, that means you have 300 beats per minute. So here's what you can do. You can count the number of large boxes between QRS complexes, divide 300 by that number, and you'll get the rate every time. 80% of the time, every time. Oh, I like that. <laughs> so uh, if that's one we can do. Or you can memorize this sequence of numbers, and it's going to help you determine the rate every time. So 300, 300 divided by 2 is 150, divided by 3 is 100, so on and so forth. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 43. Once you get that low, there's probably a better way to calculate rate. Yeah, the math's getting tough that low. But if I want you to commit this sequence to memory, along with rate, rhythm, axis, interval, signs of ischemia, this could be like the next West Side ECG stampede song. I won't be singing that. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. so let's do an example. All right, so let's take a look at this ECG, and we're going to find a QRS complex that lands on a line of a large box. So okay, here's one right one? here. Yep. That looks good. So 300, 150, 175. And now we see the next QRS complex lands just in between the 175 count, closer to 75. So this rate is probably around 80 to 85 beats per minute. Here's another way you could do this. You could just count the number of QRS complexes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 
and this is a 10 second strip, so you multiply 14 by six and you end up with some number, I don't know, 84, right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's no, perfect. Ooh, surprised myself. Uh, so that's another way to do it, especially if the rate's slower, that's a little bit easier. Yeah, when you have to count a lot of complexes though, that's a little bit more, I, I think it's more challenging and more yeah. tedious. So the, the box counting is a little bit easier in my opinion. Okay, so that's rate. Let's move on to rhythm. All right, so you know we're gonna start off again foundational here. So I think we're gonna talk just about is this gonna be a sinus or a non-sinus rhythm? So we have our normal complexes, our P, QRS, and T waves here. And to make this as simple as possible to identify a sinus rhythm, we're gonna be looking for a P wave for every QRS, a QRS for every P, a consistent P wave morphology, and that gets us like 90, high 90% of the way there. The last little bit we're gonna look at is the P wave axis. And so we're gonna be looking at two specific leads, lead two and lead AVR. And we want the P wave deflection to be positive in lead two or upgoing in lead two and negative or downgoing in lead AVR. And if the P wave axis is following that pattern, it's heading in the down and to the left direction, which is a normal axis meaning it's most likely coming from the SA node. Now, if that's not correct, or the access isn't following that pattern, you know, we sometimes think about things like ectopic atrial foci and, and things along that nature, but we'll get to that into more detail in later units. Okay, so we wanna see a P for every QRS, QRS for every P. We're gonna check that the P wave is upgoing and lead to downgoing AVR, and then we feel very comfortable saying this is a sinus rhythm, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to axis. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because I'm taking it back to vectors, baby. Oof. You know, my uh, my seven-year-old is really into superheroes right now. I mean, who isn't? I'm into superheroes as yeah, well. You too. know who his favorite one is? Uh, let's go with Batman. Well, you know him well. Have <laughs> yes. you been talking to him? I mean, we chat. <laughs> my gosh. Uh, okay. What's his second favorite superhero? Oh gosh, um, I don't. I don't know. Captain America? That's incorrect. Oh, okay, all right. good. I don't have to turn you into the authorities or anything. Uh, it's Iron Man. <laughs> oh, Iron, Iron Man is cool. Quickly been rising. Yeah. Uh, but I think that uh, we got another superhero in the making here, and his name's Vector. Oh God, no. He's got direction. He's got magnitude. M magnitude actually a, a much better superhero. Magnitude name, would I be think. good. Yeah. Yeah. And who's his nemesis? Any idea? Uh, maybe, I, maybe, let's, let's make his nemesis Einthoven. His, his ne nemesis is Einthoven, who destroys you with a ring of his triangle. Oh, no. <laughs> so let's talk about some limb leads. You got limb leads. They go from the patient's right to the patient's left. Um, and when you see that limb lead, that's called one. There's another limb lead that goes from the patient's left arm to the foot. That's limb lead three. And then limb lead two goes from the patient's right arm to the foot. There are augmented leads. So essentially, if you bisect lead one, draw a line straight down to the foot, that's called augmented lead, VF. So AVF for short. There's also AVL, AVR. I'm not gonna show those here. It just gets a little too uh, dicey, the picture does. So now let's take these vectors and move them over into an axis that we can understand. You ready for some fancy anim animations here? Ooh, you know I like fancy PowerPoint. I don't care if you're ready. It's happening. Ooh. Yeah. Ah. That's lovely. Well, that's nice. Did you enjoy that? That was really nice. Okay, so normally the axis of the resultant vector of the heart exists in this axis right here. So uh, down and to the left. So in lead one for a normal axis, would it be upgoing? The QRS complex, would it be upgoing or downgoing? Upgoing. Right, in the same direction as lead one. So how about AVF? Upgoing or downgoing? Upgoing. Correct, in the same direction. You're doing good. Now let's move over to left axis deviation. How about one and AVF there? So one would be upgoing and AVF would be downgoing. Correct, because it's moving away from AVF. How about right axis deviation? So one would be downgoing and AVF would be upgoing. Wow. It's like you had the answers beforehand. I'm very good at following your beautiful diagram. <laughs> Extreme right axis deviation. We don't. We don't really like to talk about extreme right axis deviation. Yeah, that's like the uh, the redhead stepchild of yeah. axis deviation. It's like the first rule of extreme right axis deviation club. You don't talk about. We don't talk about it. No. 
<laughs> it's probably how I, when Eindhoven like rings his triangle, it makes your heart go into an extreme right axis deviation. It just explodes. That would be less than ideal. Exploding heart syndrome. No bueno. Intervals. All right. So there are three, really only three intervals that we care about. Um, we have our PR interval, which starts at the beginning of the P wave and ends at the beginning of the QRS complex. And that should be anywhere between 120 and 200 milliseconds. Uh, the next one is the QRS complex, which starts at the beginning of the QRS and ends at the end of the QRS. It's the most simple one. Uh, and that should be less than 100 milliseconds. And lastly is the QT interval. It begins at the start of the QRS complex and ends at the end of the T. And, you know, to make this as simple as possible, it should be somewhere between 350 and 480 milliseconds. Um, this is a little bit more complex and is dependent on a few other variables. We're going to get into that in a little bit more detail as the units go on. Uh, but suffice to say, at this point, 350 to 480 is a relatively normal QT interval. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that interval's really a cutie. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> a lot of dad jokes here. A lot of dad jokes coming. Let's talk about ischemia. Notice how we've done rate, rhythm, axis, intervals before we even get to ischemia. And that's on purpose because I think uh, lesser people, not the stampeders, of course, but lesser people would miss things like uh, significant sinus bradycardias or complete heart blocks if they didn't do rate and rhythm first. So it's really important to go through that progression of things before you get to ischemia, even though that's where we all want to jump to first so that you don't miss something that's really important. So let's talk about the first sign of ischemia. The earliest sign that you would expect to see in someone with an infarct may be hyperacute T waves. We don't often see these because the patients tend to present a little bit later on in the course. This happens within minutes of someone actually developing an occlusion of their coronary system. Uh, the EMS providers may see this more frequently than we do. Uh, or if someone develops symptoms right in front of you and you get an EKG, you, you may see this, but we don't typically see it. So what we look for are broad-based, large T waves, usually greater than the size or at least close to the size of the QRS complex. This one's not greater, but it's pretty big and close. If you can fit that QRS complex under the T wave as if it were a house, that's probably too big, John, too big. Yeah. T wave inversions, especially deep ones like this one, and symmetric ones, like if I were to draw a dotted line there, that's that's not a good dotted line. That's a squiggly dotted line. Yeah, well, it's there are dots. I'm not sure it's a line, but it's dotted. <laughs> if you could draw a good dotted line vertically and bisect that T wave, in other words, like fold it over on itself, then it's symmetric. And those are much more concerning for an ischemic type pattern. There are lots of things that cause T wave inversions. We'll get into those throughout the course. Uh, but ischemic ones tend to have that appearance. ST elevations. I so see it. I see it. Even you can see this one, John. Very good. So what we see here is a large ST elevation, six millimeters worth. And we tend to compare the ST elevation against the baseline, which we define as the TP segment. There are some other ways to measure ST segments, but for the purposes of this curriculum, we're going to consider the TP segment our baseline. And then finally, Q waves. After an infarct has completed, you'll see Q waves. Q waves are generally, in order to be pathologic, they're at least one box wide. And one box is how many milliseconds? Uh-oh, 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 40? Well, you're passing with flying colors so far, John. And at least deep enough to be a third the size of the R wave. So in this case, this is actually bigger than the R wave. So this is a pretty significant and pathologic Q wave that we see here. Okay, now let's go back to our original case and try to interpret this in our, our nice stepwise approach. So uh, like we did earlier with the rate, we'll find a QRS complex on a big box and count out our 300, 150, 175, and it's closer to 75. And we actually counted out the QRS complex earlier. So this rate's 84. Um, the next we're going to look at the rhythm. So we see a P for every QRS, a QRS for every P. The P wave morphology is consistent and the axis is normal. So we have a sinus rhythm. Our overall axis for the EKG is normal as we see the QRS complexes are up going in one and in AVF. Our intervals 
all look normal, our PR is normal, we have a narrow complex QRS, and the QT, one of our shorthand ways of checking this, is to take the R to R interval, divide that in half, and if the QT segment is less than half of the R to R, that's a normal QT, or at least it's not a prolonged QT. So uh, overall we see normal intervals here, and I don't see any signs of ischemia. There's no ST elevations, no ST depressions, or no pathologic T waves, or Q waves, or um, concerning T wave morphology here. So totally normal ECG. Normal ECG. All right. That was boring. Let's move on to the next one. Now that we're, we're crawling, I think it's time to walk. Okay. You ready? All right. Yeah. All right, so this is a 50-year-old male that presented with chest pain. Go for it, John. Okay. So you again. Uh, me again. All right. Yeah. Oof. All right. So again, this, uh, this rate looks to be about 80-ish or so. If we count out our boxes, again, 300, 150, 100, squiggly line. <laughs> um, and it's between 75 and 100, uh, so probably around 80 to 85. The rhythm uh, appears sinus. The axis is normal. It's upgoing in one, upgoing in AVF. Our intervals overall look normal. Mm -hmm. And the money here is in signs of ischemia. So if we look in the anteroseptal leads, V1, V2, V3, we see pretty significant ST elevations uh, in those leads. Are you trying to count them out? How many we got there? About five? Yeah, yeah, probably four, maybe four. Four. If you compare it against the TP segment. Sure. Um, and then we also see some ST depressions or reciprocal ST depressions out laterally in V5, V6, um, and then inferiorly as well in 2, 3, and AVF. So this is a normal sinus rhythm with an anterior ST elevation MI. Yes. Even you saw this one, John. It was huge. 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 So the anatomic location of these MIs is very important. That's why we actually bother to go through the, you know, the pain of figuring out exactly where that is because all these MIs are associated, depending on the anatomic location, associated with different types of complications. So let's talk about the anatomic distributions. All right, yeah. The ECG is set up rather nicely for us. So anything that projects inferiorly to the person's, you know, like feet, that would be inferior, those exist in 2, 3, and AVF. All right, so they're all kind of clustered down there in the lower left-hand portion. The lateral leads are 1 AVL, V5, V6, and then anterior V1, V2, V3. So let's look at a schematic of the heart and talk about the different locations, what sorts of ST changes you would expect to see, and maybe talk about some of the complications too. I'll take inferior, and then John, why don't you take lateral, and um, John, why don't you take anterior, and then, John, why don't you take posterior? Yeah, it seems like I'll be doing some seems, of the heavy lifting for this one. That seems fair. Yeah, all right. So an inferior STEMI, like we had just mentioned, the inferior leads are 2, 3, and AVF, so you would expect to see ST elevations in those leads, 2, 3, and AVF. So reciprocal changes you would expect to see in the lateral lead, leads. So reciprocal changes are essentially changes that are opposite of the um, changes that you see because of the you know, anatomic area of the specific occlusion. So in an inferior MI, you would see reciprocal changes, meaning ST depressions, opposite changes, and the anterolateral leads, especially AVL is where you tend to see ST depressions for inferior infarcts, because AVL actually projects up, up and to the left. So you do see reciprocal changes in AVL. If you see that, that really clenches it. The supply for the inferior aspect of the heart is predominantly from the RCA. And so if you think about the things that the RCA supplies, you can kind of come up with what some of the complications are. If you get a proximal enough occlusion, you can infarct the entire right ventricle. That didn't sound bueno. So what might you expect from someone with an infarcted right ventricle? So these patients might be hypotensive because they have decreased preload from the right heart going to the left heart. So mm -hmm. these people are preload dependent. So right. you'll give these people fluids. You know, I always thought that was a, f a funny phrase, preload dependent. I remember being like a med student and being like, preload dependent. Yeah, I'll just say that just like I understand what cyclic AMP is. You, just you know say what? it. Do you know what falls under that same umbrella? It's when you're talking about ventilator management, just say PEEP and alveolar recruitment. <laughs> we need to do a little bit more recruitment. Uh, intensivists love yeah, that. Yeah, you just check the plateau pressure. Yeah, 
Just just fancy that. fancy vent terms. Just just start saying it. Have you tried PRVC? <laughs> Try bi level, APRV. Why don't you try those and get back with me? Let's do that. Yeah, let me know how that goes. (laughs) So preload dependence describes a state in which, especially if you've lost all of the output from the right side of your heart, that means the left side filling is entirely dependent on what your preload is, essentially more or less the CVP, the central venous pressure. So if you've got a right ventricle that's not working, the pressure gradient is really only gonna be dependent on that CVP. And so what you need to do in patients that are hypotensive with right ventricular infarcts is actually give them fluids, increase that preload. Yeah, and I mean, so then, you know, some drugs that we typically give to patients with MIs are less than ideal in that situation. Things like nitro. Should yeah. not be given to patients with RV infarcts. Yeah. Potent preload uh, reducer. So avoid nitro. And then also think about other things that the RCA provides. And it provides, it's, it supplies the nodes. So SA node, AV node. You can get sinus bradycardias. You can get AV nodal blocks um, or atrioventricular blocks uh, that are secondary to and insult to the AV node. So you can get complete heart blocks, all kinds of things like that. They typically are, uh, if you do have blocks, they have pretty good outcomes for inferior MIs. They typically resolve on their own. It's often because of an increased vagal um, stimulation. Yeah, great. So let's move on to lateral MIs. So these are almost exclusively caused by left circumflex occlusion. And we see the ST elevations in V5, V6, and then the high lateral leads, one in AVL. And we'll see in, uh, reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. Now, the lateral wall is a pretty good chunk of the workhorse of the heart, you know, from the left ventricle. Uh, these patients typically do better than, you know, anterior MIs, but these can still be pretty large infarcts that can cause a pretty significant acute drop in the cardiac output. And you can start to see these patients in shock, you know, in the mm-hmm. ED before you can get intervention on board. Um, the next group we'll look at is our anterior MIs, historically um, called the Widowmaker uh, by lay folks because these are LAD occlusions uh, and the LAD supplies just a huge chunk of the left ventricle and the supply of cardiac output of the left heart. We see the ST elevations in the precordial leads, V1, 2, V3, V4, um, and then see reciprocal changes in the inferior leads as well. Um, Ben, what are some of the complications that happen with uh, patients who come in with LAD occlusions? Well, the supply for the LAD is huge. Yeah, not, not small. Huge. So it supplies something like the anterior wall, something like 60% of the cardiac output. So these patients can go into shock rather easily. So uh, cardiogenic shock could be a presentation. Also, the LAD is responsible for the supply to the majority of the conduction system. So you can end up with all kinds of blocks, bundle branch blocks, or even complete heart blocks with like very distal escape rhythms that are slow and unreliable. So that could be problematic. Yeah, you know, the LAD also supplies the chordae tympani or the papillary muscles. Uh, And so those things can rupture and lead to like really bad mitral valve problems. So those patients need surgery and, you know, probably a chaplain. Ruptured papillary. Sounds terrible. Not ideal. All right. And so lastly, we'll talk about posterior MIs. And, you know, posterior, the posterior wall is supplied by the RCA. So occlusions of the RCA can cause posterior MIs. And you know these are these are oftentimes pretty tricky um, because we don't have technically leads on the back of the patient, so we only have anterior leads on the patient. So what we see is we actually see ST depressions in the anterior leads, leads V1 and V2 and V3. And when you see isolated ST depressions there, uh, you need to start thinking about posterior MI. And at that point, you can turn uh, or make a decision to put posterior leads on and check those. And we're going to get into that. Yeah, we got some good examples of posterior MIs. Uh, But these, you know, posterior MIs will have ST depressions in your, uh, again, V1, V2, V3 leads um, and are really, you know, they're frequently missed. And so we want to make sure that this is something that you will not miss going forward. 
you won't be like me. You'll be more like Ben. Okay. And, uh, you know, you're starting, you're learning now. <laughs> you're starting to jog. I, I know where I sit on this uh, hierarchy. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you won't miss these when they, when they ever show themselves in front of you. All right. Let's look at number next here. I'll do this one. I'll give you a break, John. Oof. All right. I was getting tired. 77 year old male that presented with shortness of breath. So let's use our stepwise approach here. So let's calculate the rate. I'm going to find a QRS on the bottom here that falls right on a wide or a uh, large box. So right here, 300, 150, 100, 75, a little bit faster than 75. Let's say 80. The rhythm, I see a P for every QRS and a QRS for every P. I notice that it's up going. The P wave is up going in lead two and it's down going in AVR. So it looks like a normal P axis as well. So this is a sinus rhythm. And now I'm going to look to rate rhythm axis. It's up in one and it's down in AVF. So that means there's a left axis deviation. So we have a left axis deviation to explain. And now let's move on to the intervals. I see that the interval, uh, the PR interval is normal. The QRS is wide. The QT looks fine. So now we've also got a wide QRS to explain. Hmm. Let's talk about the conduction system. Oh, what a nice segue. Yeah. All right. So the signal in a normally functioning individual will propagate via the SA node. It'll spread through the atria to the AV node. There's actually no specialized conduction connection between the SA node and AV node. It just goes through the atria. Now, a lot of the conduction system will have intrinsic pacemaking activity. And the rest of the inferior intrinsic pacemaking activity is usually suppressed by the more superior activity because it beats at a higher rate. The SA node has intrinsic pacemaking activity. And John, do you know what its rate normally would be? Something like a normal human, somewhere in the 60 to 100 range. What is it in a normal feline? Faster? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Good question. We'll stick with humans. Something to look up. All right, now it goes through the atria to the AV node. Um, but let's say the SA node is not working correctly. Someone has six sinus node or some sinus node dysfunction. There's sinus arrest. Uh, and now we expect some other pacemaker to sort of take over. It's no longer being suppressed by the SA node. So let's look at the AV node now. What's the intrinsic pacemaking ability of the AV node? So you're being sneaky on me right now. Yes. This is a trick question. The AV node doesn't actually have any intrinsic pacemaking capabilities. And the reason I know that is because we've recorded this nine <laughs> times and I've screwed it up eight of those times. <laughs> Can't sneak this past you anymore. Uh, but, you know, I had a good run. Yeah. yeah. For eight times. Yeah. You can right. write in my letter of recommendation. <laughs> Only takes nine times to figure something out after correction. <laughs> That's the way medicine works, though. You got to hear things. Nine's actually not bad yeah. now that I think about it. Okay, so yeah, no intrinsic pacemaking activity, the AV node. Despite what you may hear on a you know podcast or see on a blog or something online, there's actually no intrinsic pacemaking activity of the AV node. When you hear that there's a junctional escape rhythm or a junctional complex, what that really means is that it comes from the bundle of hiss, otherwise known as the junction, otherwise known as the common bundle, and that's what CB represents right here. So in someone with a junctional rhythm, how fast do you expect that to be? Yeah, so that's a little bit slower, somewhere in like that 40 to 60 beats per minute range. Yeah, uh, and also note that all of these structures, the SA node, the common bundle, these are capable, as long as there's no other downstream blocks, these are capable of producing narrow beats, narrow QRS complexes, because it's actually using the entire specialized conduction system, okay? to spread to the right and the left heart. Now we're getting below the junction into the bundles. And so if, uh, you know, if you've got a pacemaker that's taken over in the ventricular system, now how fast do we expect that escape rhythm to be? Yeah, less than 50 typically. As you get further and further distal in the conducting system, uh, the slower the rate. Right, right, right. Okay, so th this is generally what we would see in, say, someone with a complete heart block and a very distal, you know, ventricular escape rhythm. Now we're getting into much slower, less reliable rates. Yeah. Okay, so now we had this example of a left bundle. Let's talk about the scenario of a left bundle. Let's talk about what happens and what the electrocardiographically it would look like in the setting of a left bundle. Remember, the signal starts in the SA node. It spreads through the atrium. 
uh, into the AV node and from there, it goes through the junction and the right and the left bundles. It will, in the setting of a left bundle, it'll go through the right bundle just like normal, but the left bundle is blocked right here, so the signal does not spread to the left side of the heart via the left bundle like normal. It now has to travel through the myocardium from the right side of the heart, and when it travels through the myocardium via cell-to-cell -cell conduction. That, that's that's actually my favorite part of this. It's like, oh yeah, mm. traveling via cell-to-cell -cell conduction. It you makes know, you know, sound smart. You know how that works? Blah, 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 cyclic AMP. <laughs> Just you say can't. cyclic AMP a no couple of times. No one's going to challenge you. No, cyclic AMP. Come on. You didn't know that? <laughs> uh, okay. So what, but what's that going to do to the QRS complex on the EKG? Yeah, it's going to widen it. Exactly. Because now we're traveling slower through the myocardium. You actually get a wide QRS complex. Okay. Well, let's think about, let's look at this uh, sort of schematic on the right side of the screen here and think about what would happen in the precordial leads V1 and V6. So first, the septum is gonna depolarize. There, remember, there's a left bundle branch block. So it's gonna depolarize right to left. That's away from V1, so you get a small downward deflection in V1, and it's towards V6, so you get an upward de deflection in V6. You with me so far? Yep. Okay, and now let's think about what would happen to the rest of the, the wave of depolarization. It's going down the right side, just like normal, um, but it also quickly spreads to the left side. The overall resultant vector is gonna actually be, since there's much more myocardium on the left, left side than there is the right side, it's gonna actually be two towards the left side of the heart. The RV and the LV are depolarizing relatively simultaneously, but there's much more myocardium on the left side, so that resultant vector is gonna be towards the left side, towards V6. So you get this greater upward deflection in V6, and uh, conversely in V1, you get more of a downward deflection in V1. And this is what a left bundle looks like. It's primarily down going in V1 and up going in V6. You often will see a little notch there in V6 also. So you usually see that little notch as well. You'll see it in A1, AVL, V5, V6. You don't always see it. It can just sort of be a monophasic pattern, but usually you get that little notch as well. So now let's look back at our EKG of the left bundle, and we do see that it's primarily down going in V1, it's up going in V6. There is a notch right here, it's just kind of hard to see. It's actually easier to see, I think, out here in one. You see that more kind of classic appearing notch. You can see it in AVL as well. Uh, so uh, down going in V1, up going in V5, V6 with a little notch. There is a left axis deviation also. It's up in one, down in AVF. And note that left bundles are often associated with a left axis deviation because there is a lot of myocardium on the left side of the heart. And so as it travels via cell to cell conduction from the right to the left, that is enough to swing the axis. So you usually do see a left axis deviation, not criteria for a left bundle, but you usually do see it. Nice. Yeah. So let's play a little game before we okay. move on. Uh, what are some causes of left bundle branch blocks. You can never go wrong with ischemia, so I'm gonna stay safe, ischemia. It's a softball answer. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit more about the acute setting, maybe like an acute anterior MI. Well, the, um, the, the conduction system, especially the left conduction system, the left bundle is supplied by the LAD, so an anterior infarct would go along with that. Okay, I'll, get, I'll grant you that one. Yeah. Uh, how about just like old, people. <laughs> this just doesn't work well. It's just a uh, primary degeneration, Lev's, Linegray's disease. I, I think there are some fancy words for this. I, lo I love how, you know, any academic would be like, oh yeah, sure. Old heart don't work <laughs> good. That, that sounds, sounds like a great it answer. Sounds very, it's like an orthopedic answer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's fine. Squiggly lines. Can I take them to the OR? Um, how about something like the great masquerader, hyperkalemia? Yeah, you I can't go wrong like with that one either. Pseudo left bundle branch. I'm gonna get a little bit more esoteric here. Digoxin toxicity. Yeah, there you go. You love that stuff. Um, maybe like aortic stenosis. Yeah, or even hypertension, like, which is kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah, almost like the left ventricle thinks that aortic stenosis and hypertension are like the same thing. Yeah. So the same thing kind of remodels on that left side. All right, All right. I'm I'm bored with this. Yeah, it's boring. Let's let's, let's move on to the next one. All right, y'all can tune back in now <laughs> because Giordano is now going to speak. I am now speaking. So this ECG came from a 73-year-old woman who came in complaining of chest pain. Uh, the rate here is in the 80s about. 
the rhythm appears sinus. Uh, the axis is normal. Uh, looking at the intervals, the PR interval looks normal. There is a wide QRS and a normal appearing QT interval. In terms of signs of ischemia, I don't see any real ST elevations or ST depressions. I do see some T wave inversions in uh, V1, V2, and maybe even down to V3 a little bit. And I think that those are actually going to be associated with the cause of our wide QRS, which we still need to explain. So if we look a little bit more closely at V1, there seems to be this R, S, R prime pattern um, that we see with R prime being greater than R. Mm -hmm. um, and there, then there's that inverted T after that. And then if we look down in V6, there's a sort of like broad-based S wave. Um, and again, that continues out laterally into the high lateral leads in 1 and AVL as well. And this overall pattern is consistent with a right bundle branch block. And, and that sort of explains all of those findings that we're seeing. Okay, great. We just talked about left bundle branch blocks. Now we're going to talk about right bundle branch blocks. So again, the signal comes from the SA node, it travels through the atrium to the AV node, down the junction, and then it goes to the left side of the heart just fine, just like normal. Left bundle is working just fine, okay? But the right side is not. There's a block right here. So it has to travel to, in order to depolarize the right side of the heart. It has to travel via cell to cell myocyte conduction from the left side to the right side. And what's that going to do to the QRS? It's going to widen it again. Exactly. So it's, it's much slower conduction, so you get a wide QRS. And now let's take a look at this schematic again on the right and think about what's going to happen to the precordial leads V1 and V6. The septum will depolarize, and there's a left bundle branch block, so it's going to depolarize left to right. So you get a, a little upward deflection in V1 because it's towards V1. It's going away from V6. I don't know. For reasons that are unclear to me, you don't actually get a small Q wave. Let's just, uh, let's just kind of move on. Can we just move on from that? Sure. <laughs> Whatever you say. <laughs> and then the left side depolarizes just like normal. Um, but it's not opposed by the right side depolarization. So you end up getting this uh, S wave in V1, and it's also going towards V6. So you get an upward deflection in V6. And now the right side is finally going to depolarize, finally. You get a large, as that deep wave of depolarization swings to the right towards V1, you'll get a large upward deflection. So now you can clearly see your R, S, R prime in V1. And then out laterally in V6, that R prime becomes a deep and wide S wave out laterally because it's going away from V6. So this is your sort of classic morphology of, of a right bundle in the leads V1 and V6. Yeah, love it. Now we're gonna look again at the EKG for this individual, and we do see that there is an R, S, R prime. That R is kind of hard to see, but it's there. It's there, and you can actually see it much better by the time you get to lead uh, V2 here. And then by the time you get to V3, that R is getting bigger, the R prime is kind of going away. V4, the R prime is almost totally gone. You see a little notch there. And then by V5, now you've got your wide S. So the, the R um, gets bigger and bigger. You get this R wave progression across the precordium and the R prime just kind of disappears. And notice that there's no right axis deviation associated with a right bundle in the same way that there was a left axis deviation associated with a left bundle. Why might that be? Because the right heart has significantly less myocardium than the left heart, and that depolarization from left to right really doesn't have enough sort of oomph to swing the axis over to the right here. Exactly. That's right. So left bundles are often associated with left axis deviation. Right bundles not associated with a right axis deviation. So if you do see a right axis deviation, something else is going on. We'll actually walk through some examples of that scenario later on. Uh, before we move on, let's play. I, I like playing these games. I know you don't I like noticed. the games. Uh, so what are some causes of right bundle? The hyperkalemia. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> Come on, something real. How about, all right, I'll start. I got it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first with all the tough ones. How about something like right ventricular hypertrophy? And that, and that can be caused by a lot of things. Um, you know, folks with uh, pulmonary artery hypertension or people with like lung diseases, things like COPD or interstitial lung disease can cause that. You just took away like five answers right there. Yeah, I'm trying to, they, I want everyone to know how smart I am, okay? Well, I did recently have a patient with a massive PE. Massive meaning the patient was unstable. 
and she had a right bundle on her EKG. Yeah, so that can do I'd it. say a massive, or really just a PE. A, yeah. A QPE. What about just ischemia? Of course. Of Softball course. answer. Uh, how about, it's normal in infants. They normally have a right axis deviation. Kind of by the age of three, that kind of goes away. But, you know, in infants, you can see a right axis. We're talking about right bundles. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think you see a right bundle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess there's... You could just edit that later. No, I'm keeping uh, it oh, in. Oh, God. <laughs> it's staying in. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right. All right, this is our last case. A 27-year-old that presented with palpitations. And you're going to do this one, John. Oh, Okay. So the uh, the rate looks pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's find the line that we can mm -hmm. land on. You know what I'm looking at? right here. There, that one sounds good. So 300, 150, 100. So I don't know, about 125 maybe. Okay. So pretty fast. Uh, let's take a look at the rhythm. I see P waves. The P waves uh, are before every QRS. The QRS has a P wave before it. And the P wave axis looks normal. So I'm going to call this sinus tachycardia because we're fast. Mm -hmm. uh, the axis looks normal. Uh, the intervals is where I think the money is on this one. So if we look at the PR interval, uh, it looks really short. Yeah, it's like the P wave just kind of goes into the QRS complex. You almost can't even measure it. Exactly, the, yeah. And you know, I guess that, that sort of makes the QRS look wide. Uh -huh. um, but the QT looks normal to me. Uh, and I don't see any signs of ischemia, but you know, I want to take a little bit of a closer look at the uh, the PR and QRS intervals and why that phenomenon is going on. And when we look closely at it, you know, we can get a pretty nice look of a what looks to be a delta wave at the beginning of the Ooh, QRS complex. Like uh, over here in V5, you can see that wave that kind of splays out a little bit before it goes up into the R wave. Yeah. That's called a delta wave. And so what does that signify? So that's consistent with a diagnosis of WPW or yeah. some sort of accessory pathway conduction. So yeah, if you've got an accessory pathway, things are going through the accessory pathway as well as the normal conduction system. And you can kind of end up with that little slurred uptake or delta wave. And that's also why you see the short PR. It's because it's not just going through the normal AV node and the rest of the conduction system. The AV node slows things quite well, which is why you get an actual PR interval there. But in this case, it's going through the accessory pathway and the AV node and actually makes it to the, my, the vent ventricular myocardium via the accessory pathway before it does the rest of the conduction system. So that's why you get that slurred uptake. Yeah, I think this case is a good example of why we go through ECGs in a stepwise approach and then always thinking about explaining any abnormalities in each of that those steps. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to play a game. Oh, all right. The stampede game, you ready? All right, yeah. So. The idea of the ECG stampede really arose from uh, trying to come up with a system to enable and empower residents, uh, specifically in terms of any sort of any learner really to um, interpret ECGs in a rapid fashion. So triage ECGs. It's not uncommon for us to be on shift. I'm sure you've had this happen where you're doing an active resuscitation or you're just trying to go to the bathroom or whatever. And guess what happens? You're getting just thrown these ECGs in your face all the time and you've got to sign them and say no STEMI, whatever. And you've, you've also got to try to triage these patients. If you see something that's concerning, then you need to take action in that. So that was the idea of the ECG stampede was to hit you with a series of ECGs with limited resources and have you decide where you wanted to place this patient. So let's do that. Oh, okay. Sounds Ready? good. We're going to go through the ECGs that we've already deciphered, and I'm going to ask you where you would place this patient. We can talk about it. Oh, gosh. All right. Here's the first one. 39-year-old with chest pain. This was her ECG. Where are you putting this one? Waiting room. She can wait all day, every day. Totally agree. Number two, 50-year-old male with chest pain that presents, or <laughs> male that presents with chest pain. Where are you putting this one? So this guy is getting our STEMI uh, protocol activated. Definitely. Uh, if you're a PCI center, you're going to, you know, get him to the cath lab. If you need to transfer this out, you'll transfer it out, but you're gonna get all of those wheels rolling and get that process going. Agreed. This is a 77 year old guy that presented with shortness of breath. He had a left bundle. Where are we putting this one? So this one's a little bit more difficult and a mm -hmm. little bit more nuanced. Um, I would ask if I have an old EKG. Let's say you do have an old EKG and it looks the same as this one. 
Uh, I'd probably put him in the next available category if I have an old ECG that looks the same. Um, if I don't have an old one, that may push me closer towards the room immediately, but probably next available. Yeah, I agree with that. So a left bundle can obscure a lot of things like signs of ischemia. We're going to talk about that. It's actually, there are some methods to interpret signs of ischemia in the setting of a left bundle. But just suffice it to say, the left bundle is not normal. And this is an old guy with shortness of breath. So the, the probability of pathology in this guy is high. Yeah. So we probably want to do something to act on this patient. So we're going to say next available, provided that we have a prior ECG that shows this left bundle, right? Yeah. Okay. 73-year-old with chest pain, and this is her ECG. She has a right bundle. So, yeah, I would probably ask the same question if we have an old one to compare to. Um, I think this one's probably, again, falling into the next available category. Um, and if this is a you know vast change from mm -hmm. an old ECG, moving up into the, the room immediately. Yeah, I mean, I think just about any 73-year-old that presents with chest pain and or shortness of breath is probably... They probably bought themselves at quick. least yeah. ne next available. So I think that sounds pretty reasonable too. Uh, I'm waiting to disagree with you. I want to disagree with you, uh, but your answers have been surprisingly reasonable. <laughs> they don't They don't typically say that about me. <laughs> so I, I appreciate that compliment. Well, that was really a compliment. <laughs> I'm not sure how much of a compliment that was. This is a 27-year-old that presented with palpitations, and we determined that she likely has Wolf Parkinson White or an accessory pathway, but she's currently in sinus, although it is sinus tachycardia. So what do you want to do with this one? Yeah, this is another one that sort of sits on the fence. Um, you know, if this if we knew she had WPW, um, again, maybe next available or room immediately, depending on, you know, exactly what mm -hmm. the chief complaint was. Um, I'd probably uh, put next available. Ah, she's like almost 130. Never mind. I'm going to go room immediately. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I may do next available on this one. Um, honestly, depending on how the emergency department was, if it were exploding, I don't think it's crazy to put her in the waiting room. She's 27. As long as it's not a fib with Wolf Parkinson White, which we know is Very like valid. not tolerated well at all, 27 year old can probably handle, yeah. you know, a little narrow complex tachycardia right. for a little while or something. <laughs> you twisted my arm a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, probably somewhere, it, a lot of this would depend, I think, on how the emergency department felt at that time. Yeah, but I mean, I think this whole exercise is good and, and our discussion about it shows that maybe there's not an exact perfect answer for all of these. Some of them, there's well, definitely I, a right answer. I mean, I will give you the exact perfect answer every time. All right, well, I won't. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it's nice that we get to talk about these things and sort of think through exactly how we're going to triage these folks when our department's potentially burning down. Agreed. Until unit two, Stampeders. We'll see you next time.